And in 1995, I was in a psychiatric institution with major anxiety disorder, panic disorder, PTSD, and depression. So welcome to the conference. I'm so happy you're here. And so I don't mean to be flip, I really don't, but it's my story and I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. It's why I'm here with you today. I am Tammy West and that is my story. Welcome to Consider Yourself Hugged, a place to find comfort and support as you navigate your mental and emotional well-being. So sit back and relax unless you're driving and get ready for this week's hug. Welcome back, fellow huggers. I am beyond excited for today. Um, first of all, I mentioned to you last week that today would be the end of this season. And the funny thing is, is I didn't even really think about it. I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't stopped recording in like 11 months or something, 10 months. I was like, probably need to take a break for a while. And I shared with you that Michelle is coming back to spend some time with us. So I've missed her so much. I know that you all have missed her. So just in case, you know, I didn't even think Michelle about like reintroducing you. So should I? I guess I should. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you have many more followers than when I was. Oh, right. You ha actually, it hasn't been that long. I don't know if you if you realize that, but it really hasn't. Only a like year? Is that right? has a it year? I don't think it's been a year. Oh well. Anyway, people are going okay. We have like insight to all these conversations. But if you don't know, Michelle Kicksmiller is a psychiatric nurse practitioner. She's been my dear friend for twenty years. 20? Yes. We taught high school together. We both left within just a few years of each other to pursue our passions. And she'll she'll tell you more as we go through. But when we talked about doing this today, it was such a great end to the season because she really, her passion to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner in part stems from the experience this she's going to share with you. So we we actually have a little bit of a plan, which we used to not, <laughs> but also organically. So thank you for coming back with me. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for asking me. Of course. And so tell me, and she, Michelle messaged me and said, do you think loving someone to death is like too, I don't know, what, what word did you use? Is it too, I don't know. Uh, you, I, do you want me to look? I don't know. Something, I mean, uh, harsh. I know that's kind of what harsh. I had, had meant, but um, because it's, yeah. No, it's okay. But I, whatever it was, I was like, no, I think it's great. And then when she sent me, some of her notes, um, we we always get on. Well, we've already been on for like 35 minutes just catching up. And we start going to the topic. And I'm like, nope, stop. We can't talk about it. We have to wait until it's time to talk about it. So here we are. So get us started, Michelle. Right. Like what? Right. Give us um, the backstory. Yes. So we, um, and I, Tammy and I were talking and we were talking about like, uh, maybe getting to do a podcast together before the end of, of this season. And we picked the date June 6th as the day we both um, could record. And I said, well, that is the anniversary of my brother's passing. And so kind of organically through that, we talked and decided that we would do the podcast today on him his um, experience, his life, the different lessons me, my family learned mm -hmm. from all of that. And the title, Loving Someone to Death, um, it, again, like it can um, be taken harshly in this this case, but I want to, to just start out by saying that like anytime you have someone who is struggling and um, as you'll see in his story, my brother did struggle in his lifetime, starting at about age 13 with alcohol, and then it um, progressed to some other substances as well. But when you have a loved one that's struggling, you so very, very much want to help them. Mm -hmm. And that's where that, that comes from. Sometimes you can kind of love them so much that it's not good for them. And the reality is like, there was nothing malicious in anything. Me, my mom, my dad, my sister, like there was nothing malicious in any of the things we did that now I think, you know, we recognize as enabling. You want so much for this person to be okay. 
that you you don't know what to do. You're kind of kind of at a loss, and so uh, that's going to be part of the story. I have mentioned many times on the the podcast, and I'll mention again for those of you that um, that haven't heard this that I'm also very active in the Celebrate Recovery ministry at a local church. My first time being involved with Celebrate Recovery was right after my brother's passing, and so one of the things I worked really hard on through that was um, codependency. Uh, Codependency kind of defined as being the caretaker of other people's emotions. And that's going to kind of play into the story as well. And And I'm going to say too, if you don't mind, we did a session on codependency. Yeah. If you're okay, Um, I'm okay. So yeah. And so we'll put a link. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm just going to start out and and tell you a little bit about my brother, if that's okay. And and it it is, but do you mind if I just interject? Because I, right now, I feel like I'm listening as a listener, as opposed to like a host. And I feel like the people who are listening and watching you, um, like, I feel like I'm them right now. And I'm listening to you. There are going to be things that you're going to share today that I don't know, because we haven't spent a lot of time. I know about your brother and we have stories here and there, but I'm processing it as your friend and also in light of my own experiences. And so I just want to say to viewers and listeners that we've all probably had someone in our family or someone close who has struggled with addiction or other types of mental health issues. And so I hope that you will really, you know, try to tune other things out if you're driving or if you're in your office, um, because Michelle has a lot of really good things to help you with today. And I'm looking forward to learning from you too. So just wanted to interject that before you jumped in. So yeah, tell us about your brother, his story. One of the things like I, I have mentioned and I mentioned often like in speaking about like how my brother was definitely one of, of the reasons I you know, switched careers and went the mental health uh, direction. But I realized in getting this podcast ready that I've never really talked about like who he was and how wonderful he was. Mm-hmm. And so I want to take a few minutes and just, just share about that. So my brother is um, four years younger. He was four years younger than me. I have a sister that's eight years younger than me. So we were spaced four years apart. So I was big sister. I um, sent a picture to kind of be included in the show notes of us when we were little. Yes. I'm probably around six and I am just holding him as tight as I can. And he about two years old. And I can tell you that I loved being a big sister and so some of the things about my brother that like I still marvel at to this day is like he was the best at loving people and thinking outside the box. Those are the two things I can say that he was amazing at. He gave the best hugs. And like even from the time that he was little, he would have all of these like entrepreneurial ideas. Like he did not see life like within the boundaries of any box. Like he was, he was great at, like, I, I can remember one time, like he was very, very little. And he asked my dad, like, we live in a small town and, you know, at that time we would say, okay, you know, we're going to go to town for groceries or whatever. That was the the phrase. (laughs) And it seemed like so far away when in in reality, it was like eight minutes. Right. (laughs) 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 Right. But we would drive into town, the eight minutes. Into town. You didn't drive into town. You probably drove into town. Yes. That's exactly where we drove. (laughs) Absolutely. Here in Tennessee. um, Yes. East Tennessee. Like, Mm -hmm. um, and so, Like one day he was like, well, I don't understand dad, why we just don't build a town. We had some land off from our house. Why don't we just build a town in, you know, in our field and, um, make money? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's like, so like, he was like that his whole life. That was when he was really little, but like all of these amazing ideas and creativity that he had looking back now, like as a mental health professional, I, I I see now that, um, there was some ADHD, and then kind of later on in um, like when he probably starting 10, 11, 12, some depression set in, but like he idealized, I mean, was absolutely, everything was amazing. And how the ADHD fits in is he was impulsive, like even as a, a little kid, but it was, um, it was fun. Like as his big sister, as a caretaker, 
he would give me a run for my money. I can remember like a, a time when um, my mom left him, me, my cousin, who's a year older than me, in the car while she went in. And she had a sunroof and she'd left the sunroof open and he climbed out of the sunroof in order to get out of the car and like here me and my cousin are trying to grab a hold of him trying to like he just like had no boundaries there was not a boundary when he was um 16 I was already no no he wasn't even 16 yet he would have been 15 he called me I got a collect call from New York from him the days of collect I, calls Yes, I of course answered it. And he had just decided him and his friend that they didn't really want to go to school that day. And they took his little truck and they drove to New York. From Tennessee? From Tennessee. Yeah. So he's 15. He just got his little truck and drove to New York. So no, I mean, a lot of things, but no driver's license. No driver's license. Uh -uh. No, no, just. And again, like. (laughs) What did you. you So. (laughs) <laughs> exactly I made the face you were making like right jaw dropping yeah okay yes. and like it, and as far as like the reason for the call he just wanted to tell me he was in New York he didn't want anything he didn't want any like money he he just wanted to share that experience with me that that he was there we are we were so different I was so like I was a rule follower and he knew no rules and so like Personality wise, my sister always describes him as, you know, when he walked into a room, particularly, and, and this is more like after um, the second part's more after the addiction started, but like when he walked in the room, he was either going to light it up with joy or burn it down. And there wasn't like a middle, middle ground. Yeah. And like I said, the burn it down was more like after the addiction started. But um, like he was just, an amazing person and like when you look at who someone is before addiction and then you look at who they are after addiction um it's sad what addiction steals from us you know michelle um i hope you don't mind me saying this but michelle grabbed tissues before we started and i grabbed tissues as well and i don't like I'm processing the person in my world and thinking about how it's so good to go back and have those positive memories. It's also making me a little bit sad, you know, that I don't have that kind of relationship with that person anymore, but that it wasn't always the way your brother wasn't always the way that things went after the addiction. Yeah. That is getting all burned down the room, right? I mean, there is, yeah. And he started so early. Like um, he, like I had mentioned, loved family so much. And um, there was a divorce. (laughs) And um, there had been actually. How old were y'all when your parents? Divorced. So like, if you remember, there was two divorces. So my parents divorced when I was nine and he would have been five. And they got remarried two years later. And then they got divorced. They separated when I was 17 and he was 13. And so um, I think it was hard on him the first time, but it was really hard on him the second time. And um, and again, when I say these things, like it, at no point am I saying things to place blame. Mm-hmm. There was nothing ever done maliciously, but like the the divorce was very hard on him. He had a hard time accepting it. And he started drinking not long after. That's my, so young. Yeah, 13. And and I know, Tammy, I've mentioned to you before, like with um, being a mental health professional now and looking at the research and some of the things that I deal with at work, like the research really says that when someone starts using substances at, you know, 12, 13, 14, the risk of addiction is just increased by multiples. And what they really think now that someone that young, not only do they experience the high, but they experience the high more intensely than someone that's an adult. And so one of the presenters for um, a conference I did described it as you have these individuals, they have this fully developed, maybe overdeveloped reward system, and they have no breaks because their frontal lobe isn't developed yet they don't have the mechanism to understand the risk 
And so it really kind of sets them up for difficult situations. And really by the time, so he started at 13, by the time he was, was 16, I mean, 16, 17, I would say like he would have, um, like he could have been classified as someone struggling with alcoholism and that's fairly young, but that, um, that's looking back and, and knowing everything that was going on, I would say that's probably, probably the, the case. And, and my parents at that time, their second divorce was very difficult. I mean, there was a lot of, um, contention between them. There was a lot of fighting and my brother kind of just went and did his own thing. And so through that, he, um, had access to quite a, a few things that, probably your average 13, 14 year old wouldn't have access to. You mean, like, so, you mean like alcohol and drugs, alcohol and drugs. Yeah. And like, by the time I kind of, you know, we, I caught on what was going on and I started like, you know, saying to my parents things like, Hey, you know, I, I, I think that, that Scott is drinking a lot. My brother's name was Scott, Scott Smith. Um, that, oh, yeah, we didn't say that, did we? No, no, that was very important. And I completely left that out. Um, but like I was telling them, you know, there's senior parties, small town after graduation, there's always senior party. And I said, you know, don't let him out. I told my dad, don't let him out that night. And um, my dad, he really kind of had a hard time thinking that, I don't know if it was, you know, just, just accepting kind of what was really going on. And my brother crashed his truck and um, the police officer said when he saw him, he thought he was dead. And so, and the, the reality was he walked away from it unhurt because often with alcohol, the more intoxicated you are, the more kind of limp your body is. And, and so a lot of times with, with mm -hmm. accidents, it's not the intoxicated person that walks away with the injury because their body is very relaxed. And, and so, but the police officer, I mean, to hear a police officer say, when I walked up on him, I thought he was dead. And you were like already in college or out of college by this point. So, so this you weren't, point, you weren't there to, or were you still living at home? No. So that is, that was actually like right before, um, I, I left. And so, well, actually it was, no, I'm sorry. It was right after because he started driving at 14. My dad bought him a truck. He, um, he bought him a truck and just kind of let him again, small town that, that wasn't completely uncommon for people to be driving young without a license. Um, that's not okay, but like that, it wasn't necessarily. Yeah, like I get, you're not condoning that, right? right, right, right. <laughs> It's it's a little different mentality wise now than if you're like, oh, I'm gonna buy my 14 year old truck and just let him, yeah. I'm gonna let him go. And so it was a little bit after. And um, so, you know, before that, there were some other things that had kind of started coming up. And so it's very difficult because you can kind of when I think back, I can see where the alcohol and as far as the other substances, I do think his the alcohol was his drug of choice, but at the same time there were other substances and I don't fully know what they were. Um, his friend told me he liked pills, you know, that's as much as I know about that. And so like hmm. to watch him shift from who he was to having kind of the addiction step in and take over and the chaos that then ensues when so that started happening. Yeah. It'd be so hard for you. And it, um, to kind of to fast forward and again um when he was in his last year of college he was going to school for aerospace administration um and so it was it was the summer obviously june 6th his anniversary and he had one more semester left in the fall before graduation so um again it's a long time ago 19 years I so, know. Gosh. Yeah, to, yeah to be um like then to be kind of in my um, twenties observing all this and now being in my forties kind of reflecting on it. But like he, like I said, that that one semester left, but had struggled. He had been, um, in course, he'd been in jail for having marijuana at his apartment. He had, um, multiple, multiple DUIs. The judge 
uh, my grandmother used to babysit him. So he like repeatedly let him off. And again, like for a while, he's one of the people kind of that I had to put on my forgiveness list, but um, not a, a bad person, just wanting to help out, wanting to help out my dad, wanting to help out my brother. And it uh, was, but, a, I mean, not like you said, not giving, but it was even 20 years, 19, 20, 22, 23, you know, all the time he was going through this, it was a different time. It's a different time. And that judge actually after that, and I don't know how many years later, um, started a recovery court in our hometown. Wow. So it's really done a, amazing things. But at that time, just kind of gave my brother a whole lot of chances to where like at that point, you know, me, my sister were like, really, he shouldn't have a license. Like that's like, this is not like, there's um, a, a story that like my sister and I remember where my brother called my dad and he said, you know, I need you to help me get, you know, I need you to help me get home. And my dad was thinking he need he was going to have to go somewhere and pick him up. And, you know, my dad says, okay, you know, son, where are you? And he said, I'm in the yard by a tree. So he had, he was so intoxicated that he made it home, but was too intoxicated to get from his truck to the house. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, I mean, when you, you look at, at all of, of that, like when, um, and I guess it would have been, so June 6th, that year was a Monday on Friday, uh, the Friday before, um, I got the call that everybody that like is in this situation and has a loved one that's struggling is afraid they're going to get. So I had actually, um, for whatever reason, you know, my phone was in my, my purse and I had just decided like I was sleeping on the couch for whatever reason. I don't even remember why, but that's what enabled me to hear my phone in the middle of the night. It went off. I didn't answer it, but it was my aunt. She left me a message wanting to know if I'd heard about Scott mm -hmm. and telling me to call her back. So I called her back and she told me that he'd been in an accident and that they were taking him to Vanderbilt. He was a student at MTSU and that they needed me to get there first um, because it was going to take them. It was a three hour drive for them. So they wanted me to get there first. So got dressed. I went there. And at that time I was thinking it was a car accident, but what had actually happened is it was a fall. He was at a party third floor at, um, one of the apartment complexes close to MTSU and which is very Middle Tennessee Tennessee State University. Yes, Middle Tennessee State, University. yeah, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Yeah. And he um had fallen off of the balcony and and hit. He hit on his feet, which they said was a really bad thing. And so um when I got there, because one of the first things I asked and it was also one of the first thing my parents asked, because you have such fear was, was there anybody else involved? Right. Because, you know, you have this loved one and you love them so much and you don't want them hurt. But you also know they're driving around drinking and you're worried about them taking out a family. Right. I mean, you're worried. That was about, before you knew it was a fall. It was before I knew it was a okay. fall. OK. OK. So I, I asked them and they said, you know, no. And that's when they described to me that it was a fall. And um, then they took me in to see him. And I almost passed out and they got a chair for me to, to sit with him. Was he conscious? And, Did he ever have consciousness? No, no. And, and really like one of the neurologists said to us, and, and it's probably true. I mean, one of the, well, I guess it's difficult to know whether this would be, have been the right thing, but the neurologist said, we have the capability now to bring people back and keep them alive when we probably shouldn't. So no, he never woke up and like they intubated him without any kind of pain medication, like after the accident. So more than likely, yeah. like to a good degree, you know, he was gone at that time. Like he, what, I mean, not to get into specifics, but when you land on your feet with a fall like that, like it, it, the brain stem kind of enters the base of the oh. your skull. Mm. So, I mean, it's just a, it was re just a really catastrophic Yes. In and so he never responded. I mean, there was never any response. There was um, a reflex that in nursing school, there's two different kinds of posturing. And this one, 
that he was doing is considered like the one you don't want. It's called the flyaway to heaven posturing. That's what, what we called it in nursing school. And so he was doing that, but that was the only thing. What does that thing. mean? I mean, without going into the detail. So yeah, like I mean, what he was moving his, he was rotating his arms. And okay. so like you see someone that is moving and you think, cause one of the things, so, so the things that they look for is, is this person responding to pain? What are their pupils doing? And so like the only thing, like he was doing that posturing, but it's a reflex. And that's, that's the only thing he never responded in any way to anything. anything. Okay. Yeah. And so um, like Glasgow score wise, like the lowest you can get is a three and that's the coma score. And he, he was a three, like, and so, well, and, you and know. I think back to just to, just to say, I mean, you weren't a nurse practitioner at that time. I know I wasn't in, and I wasn't a nurse. Oh. I wasn't in health. Was right. You were, you were teaching, we were teaching together at that point. So even though you had a science background, so you understood probably some of the terminology, but you weren't, it wasn't like you went in there knowing what to look for knowing what to ask. Right. Oh, and that like, and this is a, a whole other show, but those things that I just mentioned are things that if you don't, if you're not familiar, sound hopeful, like a three isn't a zero and posturing is movement. And so there's, there's things there's that, like, yeah, because you, you interpret it differently than what's, um, what's going on. But, um, you know, my parents got there, they immediately started talking to my, um, family about like whether he was an organ donor my mom shut that down real quick mm -hmm. and um like just the process that happened from that Friday to they finally um convinced them to turn off life support on Monday and so like the process from Friday to Monday was a lot of up and down the way that something like that works is you have different specialties that come in and again, not knowing kind of how all this works, like one special specialist may give you very hopeful news because like, like, for example, you know, somebody's came in and was talking about like his busted eardrum and like, oh, I can fix this. And so what my parents hear is there's hope. Wow. But if, if you don't have any brain activity, that's not really, you know, that's not really going to help in the end. And so it's very much, it's like a, a big roller coaster of emotion and the way things are going because, you know, one minute you're hopeful, the next one you're, you know, you're not. And, you know, that had happened in my, my, um, you know, the, the head person neurology wise comes in with the residents and my dad asked him um, about his knee, about like, if, if, you know, he thought, you know, he'd have any knee trouble and the man, um, and, and again, we have talked, we talked earlier about this. It's a little difficult. Um, this is just one of the things I kind of had to um, put on the forgiveness list to, or I'm having to like, is he laughed. He said, Mr. Smith, if there were a hundred patients in a room like your son, 99 would be dead and one would be a vegetable for the rest of his life. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so that is very, yeah, yeah. So my dad kind of couldn't, oh, gosh. That and he left. And then that same guy came in and talked through with my mom, all of the reasons that, um, really they should go ahead and, and end life support. So, and I was there with her for that conversation. Your poor mom. Well. well, all of you, but you know, you it's, think, well, and, and this is like, I'm sharing this story now because, you know, I think that it's the fear, right? It's the fear that if I don't do this, this is going to end up happening. If I don't do this for this person, if I don't get them out of this, if I don't do this, this is going to happen. But the reality is it happened anyway. So you mean during, during your relationship with him, all of the things that you all were doing, oh, yeah. there, were, there were so many, that. yes, there were so, there was so much enabling. And again, we didn't know, I mean, you don't know, like it became clearer closer to the end, but but you don't know. I mean, I can remember one time when, you know, closer to the end, I was separated, um, going through a divorce at a very young, my, my son was very young and I was in school at Cumberland to get my master's degree in education. Cause as you know, 
as a teacher, the only way you can make more money is the number of years you're there and like the degrees you have. And it's so yeah. much more money. No, no. It's that like was sarcasm. Well, you see, I, got yeah. my, I got my master's too, but it felt like a lot of money. <laughs> right, right. It, it, it yeah. definitely. Yeah. So here I'm like there trying to, to get my master's to like, you know, increase my income. And I get out of one of the finals and I look at my phone and my dad had just been blowing up my phone and I call him and not to say he was angry with me, but he was agitated. He was agitated that I hadn't answered because my brother um, was in jail and he wanted me to go pick him up. And so when you think of that dynamic that like, I'm trying to, to, you know, support myself, my son, increase my income. And you're going through the divorce, divorce, separation and all of it. But with, when there's someone like with that active addiction, that kind of is the crisis at the moment he's in jail, you know, you're closer, go pick him up. Like, and, and that ends up being like, like a normal, that ends up like turning into the normal sometimes. And it just takes some redirecting to, to change that. And, and again, like, even when you're aware of it, so like, it's, it's one thing it's, it's hard when you don't know it's enabling, but it's still hard even when you know it is. It's oh, still- it is. Yeah. And, and it feels like, I was just thinking about this. It feels like, okay, so oftentimes in the world of someone who is, how do I word this, battling addiction, and even in even in our own minds, there are two options. You are either caring, which really is enabling, or you don't care, which means you don't do the things that are bad for them. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like the way that it appears is either you care or you don't. Yeah. And like, I think that the fear too, like is I, if I don't help them, I might lose them, but like, there's no control either way. I mean, you know, if, if I practice tough love and I let them be homeless or I let them be whatever, then they might not make it. And there's no guarantee either way. And that's what is so difficult and I've described before when you're watching someone struggle with addiction it's it's like washing watching a fish like that has been set on the side of the stream a fish struggle out of water you want so much to help them they are struggling so much that sometimes like like an impulse is to help them get back to this other situation to to keep them from struggling but in reality that keeps them from doing the work to get to a healthier place so it's just, it's just difficult. It's difficult. And it, it just requires a lot of support. Do you think that during that time period that, like, okay, so where you are now, it's 2024, it's been 19 years, you're extremely self-aware. Um, you and I both, we talk about this before, therapy off and on for basically our entire adult Ever, life. Yeah. <laughs> you're training in the NP program. I mean, all of the things. So you have so many tools and skills. It doesn't mean you're perfect. I know that, although I think you're perfect, but it doesn't mean that you do everything right, but you have such a different level of awareness now than you did then. But do you think during that time, were there things that you did, like, were you able to, to back away at all from like enabling behavior or was, are we looking at this all through the rear view mirror? Too late. And when I say too late, again, I'm like, trying to make sure I I realize that like, it's not anyone's like, there's no malicious intent. But when I, when I started realizing like, this is not the way this is not helping things had gotten to a pretty drastic point. And so I, I think that, you know, by that point, I was kind of, a voice and kind of trying to guide my parents and say, Hey, don't do this. You know, he needs to face the consequence of this to feel it. There has to be a reason he wants to change. This is destroying his life. There has to be a reason that he wants to give this up. Um, And my mom kind of got on board before. And my dad did, I think he was maybe half on board, but like it, um, Mm-hmm. it was difficult because it wasn't just me. This was our family. This was our family dynamic. And 
when there's somebody struggling, sometimes they take the focus of the family. Oh yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, if you, you look at like time, energy spent, like it's not equal right. divided, right? That person, um, just by what's considered need takes up a lot of the space. You know, when you sent me some of the things you were th- talking about and you did, you did mention that fish out of water, which I'm so glad that you talked about that. Um, and you talked about like watching them struggle and how hard it was. You you put in there something that you we you and I started to talk about before, but then we put the kibosh on it to make sure that we didn't forget. And you said something about addiction and and you you said this was a common theme, but I don't know that everybody has heard this phrase. And will you do you know what I'm talking about? The addiction, yes. So um, and this is not my saying, it is from like um something I heard from Celebrate Recovery. And um, the saying is, you know, addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. And so, I mean, when you think about it. I had never heard that before. And I haven't, you know, I haven't been in the, I haven't been in recovery programs. Um, I I thought about it just based on, you know, some family things, Um, but I had not heard it. But I think so there may be listeners and viewers who have never heard it as well, but I think that that phrase can be so like specific with addiction, but can also be with so many other things. Yeah. And I think I think that's so powerful. And then you you kind of put that in the realm of like also the the codependency. So you're you're watching your brother be the fish out of water. Um, you're wanting him to have a reason, you know, to to give that up, to give up that one thing for everything. But then the things you've been talking about really are codependency, which we have. Did we already say that? We said we had a link, right? That we'll put in. I think we already said that once. Yes, we did. Yeah. And like codependency, we kind of just, the last time we talked about it, defined it as like being the caretaker of others' emotions, oftentimes for your own sense of peace, just as much as theirs. So codependency can be very fear-based. I know in my case, it was, you're so afraid you're going to lose them. You're so afraid there's going to be this, this loss. You're so afraid that they're going to ruin their life. I mean, there's a lot of fear. Codependency is very fear-based and it can sometimes keep you from doing the things that may be best for, for that person and, and for you. And, and so, um, and if I can just interject there too, that you said that's such an important thing that it's when you're battling these issues in your family, you forget about yourself. Like oftentimes completely, it's like, like you said, it takes over everyone and everything. And then your emotional needs are just not, not only are they not met, but they're sort of trampled on and just bashed away. And that's not a life. That's, 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 well, it's not the same as the person who's living in the addiction, but it's still a terrible life to have to be worried like that all the time. Yes, it's good. very fear and, and anxiety based and under, understandably. And I, I think that um, like kind of looking at each individual situation and like having that support to be able to like untangle all of the emotion, because I think it's so like one of the things like going to celebrate recovery for um, codependency helped me see is it's so easy to pick out when somebody else is telling the story. isn't it I mean it is and it's so hard to 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 understand it when it's you because of all that enmeshment but like it's not that you don't know or that you can't pick it out or that you wouldn't tell somebody well you shouldn't be doing that for them but it's just different and so like like hearing those things and being able to apply it and take you know you know take and untangle all the emotion can be really helpful yeah. And I want to interject too now before I forget, because so Michelle has shared with you like her brother and his path, which I think you did a great job painting that picture. And we've transitioned just a bit ago, really, I think to the lessons, right? As far as, you know, what she learned through all of this. And so some of the things you sent me, um, we've talked about a little bit about codependency and the addiction and giving things up. Um, but you put something on there too about schema therapy, like so, what- yeah. So um, schema therapy is 
therapy that talks about emotional needs. And there's so many different things that could apply to this. And I just kind of picked that because I feel like schema therapy, when you're looking through this, is very applicable for the person um, that's struggling in addiction and for the person um, who's in that codependent relationship, because you can kind of see through this that no needs are being met. And so like you have this behavior and you're acting on this behavior in hopes of change, but in reality, nothing is changing. And like the the things you're hoping for just, just aren't occurring. And, and when with schema therapy, they talk about five basic needs, emotional needs. The first one being secure attachment to others. And so when you think about that, when it comes to kind of that relationship where you have someone struggling with addiction and then you have someone in that codependent relationship, like, like that cannot by definition be a secure attachment, right? Because you like obviously um, addictive behaviors, who that person is, is not who they were before the addiction. Some of their choices is definitely skewed by the addiction. And as like the person in, in the relationship or the family member, like a lot of that relationship is based on fear. And so there's no, there's no security. There's not. Right. Yeah. I think it was and, kind of like a slinky, like they are close and well, and then shoo, far away. And neg I don't know, that may not be a very good thing, but yeah, I can, I can see that. So, so, and, and, and Quick question. Sorry. Did you go through, I've not heard of schema therapy. Like I've heard of some, you know, CBT and a lot of the different, but I haven't heard of this. Did you go through that? And one other question, did your brother, cause we didn't talk about this. Did he receive any like formal treatment? So, I mean, those are, are great questions. I'll start like with the first one. Um, schema therapy is not something that, that I did in therapy, but it is something that I've studied since then. Um, so more from that perspective, but uh, you know, and the things like I do a lot of continuing education, a lot of studying, and I pull out the things that I feel like I've seen mm -hmm. that have practical value. And so not everything, but I felt like this was very applicable. My brother did not. Well, so he, I've mentioned this in another podcast, but he at one point did have a suicide attempt when he was, um, and he would have been 14. He had a suicide attempt and he did not get any follow-up care because there was a lot of stigma around mental health care. At the end it's kind of differing another topic called another podcast, but right. a lot of stigma and my parents really felt like it would ruin him if he had to be hospitalized for like a mental health thing. So um, he took a bunch of pills and um, had to have his stomach pumped. He did have alcohol in his stomach at the time as well. In addition to, to the pills. Gosh. Um, so he he received care in the ER, but no follow up care. And then when he was an adult, um, he did go to a psychiatrist, but he was well into um, his addiction. And at that time, the psychiatrist told him that he had to stop drinking in order for him to help him or prescribe him any medication. And my brother did struggle from an early age with pretty severe dep depression. It runs in the family. And that's not really the way that's treated now. Like there are, are definitely like other things that would be said, but, but back then that's what he told him. And my brother wasn't willing to go up the alcohol. Wow. So, it wasn't willing to give up the one thing. He was not. No. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and let me, I, I got us off track here because you started talking about the five needs and I just, I wanted to clarify just to see um, about your brother. So um, one of the needs you said was secure attachment to others, which doesn't can't and doesn't happen what's the next one and, and don't and I, I want to say this as well because it can be confusing like when someone is depending on you to um, get them out of trouble meet all their needs let them continue in their destructive behavior they might think that's a secure attachment to you um, but that's not, that's not what is meant by that that's not what the, yeah gotcha. because the second one is autonomy and when you're doing that for someone, you're really taking away their, auto their autonomy. Autonomy being defined as being allowed to feel confident in your independence and ability to complete tasks. Are your choices keeping someone else from achieving this? And are they keeping you 
from achieving this is kind of the, the question that goes along with this. Like, are you keeping somebody from, from functioning as they should? And are they keeping you from doing the things you need to do because you're on a hamster wheel trying to keep that person afloat? And, you know, translating this too into a, because you and I are both, you know, Jesus following Christians and translating this into, am I, by doing all the things for this person, keeping God from working in their lives because I'm trying to be in control of it. Um, so, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. that point spoke to me a lot. Um, you and I've talked about autonomy before. And I mean, autonomy is so important. You see it in all the research about even being happy in the workplace or in a relationship, we we need to be able to have confidence in our abilities. Um, and even in the mental health first aid that I teach, which I'll put the link to the, those of you that listen a lot, I talk about it all the time. But one of the steps there is when you are helping bridge someone between um, what they're going through and what they need is giving them a sense, like asking them, you know, um, you know, what have you done in the past that has helped you or at least giving them a sense of not feeling like they are your project. Yeah. Empowerment. So, we all need to feel empowered to, to live the life that, that we want to live. Yeah. Uh, the third one was freedom to express valid needs and emotions. And so, you know, again, from a codependency side, like, Codependency almost completely shuts that down, right? Because needs and emotions, oftentimes you're afraid to share the things. And you don't even know, like you mentioned before, do you really know what your needs and emotions are because you're too busy trying to take care of other people's needs and emotions? Right. And, and now this did, you know, I've talked about, because when my children were little, it was the height of, I mean, it was, I was in the psychiatric hospital while they were young children. And then even after that, it took a long time to, to just begin to heal. And so I wouldn't say harsh consequences for them voicing their needs or fears, but I will say, and, and my boys have told me this, that I didn't really allow them to express their emotions, you know, like, no, you're not allowed to be mad. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just something that I realize now as an adult that in any relationship, whether it's your children or your friends, people have to be allowed to speak up, you know? Well, and, and like I put that on, on here, were there harsh consequences growing up for voicing your needs or fears? And I don't think like it's not done because people realize like no one's like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to like, you know, try to stifle my children. Like, I'm no, one, you no. Yeah. But I, I do remember like in, in my house, we weren't allowed to cry. Like if you cried, then like you didn't, like get X, Y, Z. And so like, but I, I do believe, and I very much, you know, understand my mother and kind of the way she, you know, her background and so forth and why she did the things she did. And in her mind, it was protecting us and it was making us strong and that's what was needed. Um, but at the same time, like there is also like some dysfunctionality that develops when you're not allowed to express how you're feeling or your needs and you kind of have to like just shut them down that's interesting just one more thing I want to say about that because what you just said really helped me it might help somebody else um because I was about to say well that was good that your mom had something in mind that she was trying to protect you or help you but she may not have known that but I was thinking well I didn't wasn't trying to do anything helpful to my children however really and truly because my mom let my sister and me just do whatever. And thank God that didn't go down the, you know, a path that it could have, but there were no rules. We were allowed to be very disrespectful and that affected me. And I think I probably was just like looking at my children thinking, well, they're not going to be disrespectful to me and they're not going to misbehave. And so, you know, maybe it was a protective thing. Anyway, thanks for the therapy, Michelle. <laughs> okay. What's next? <laughs> So for, this was an interesting one because like this is never like spontaneity in play. And like, so when I first like was studying this, I'm like, what? <laughs> that's, that's an emotional need, spontaneity in play. And like, you know, the, the 
statement I have underneath it, were you always the caregiver or did you get time to play and be carefree when you were young? Do you take the time to be carefree now or do you feel like it's frivolous? Mind blown? Yeah, I mean, it's like, like, you know, I think we've talked about this before in a different capacity, but we're both caregivers. I mean, that's that's what we dedicate our life to in terms of like trying to to help but like the fact that an emotional need especially when you're um young but even as an adult is to have time to be carefree and to be yourself and not to carry the weight of the world around with you like I said like when I, I study that I'm like what that that's a thing do you think that you and or your brother like what do you how do you think that applied to the two of you growing up so being the oldest, like I was the caregiver. And the two I mean, divorces. Oh, so, and it kind of part of the, the story, like my mother, um, she struggled with depression as well. Although like that was not, again, it wasn't a thing that was talked about or, or um, diagnosed, but like she had cancer. Uh, she, well, there was a divorce. She had cancer. Then she had cancer again. And then there was another divorce. And she was never really given tools to control um, pretty intense emotions. She had a really difficult childhood, really difficult. And there's some things that happened in her family that she got a lot of teasing and bullying for when she was in middle school and on up. And she was very adamant that we not share things about our family. Again, very protective. She did not want us to have to go through the same type of bullying that she went through. And so like what that translated to is like, she had a lot of really difficult things she went through and not really a lot of um, like practice or tools. And so a lot of times, like when something really difficult would happen, there'd be kind of a shutdown period and being the oldest, I kind of stepped in as the caregiver. And so that, that happened just on and off as we were growing up. And my brother told people like when he was alive that I raised him like she, he he would say that to people like and you know that's not true my parents were there and, and and they did as well but like he emotional support wise like he and my sister both like at times would would come to me because I had taken on that role of being the peacekeeper Yes. Like I was the one who was trying to make everything just go smoothly. And in some regards, even as a, as a child, in addition to, to what was going on with Scott, like I enabled some things to go on because I felt like that's what was supposed to happen. There's some times when I should have probably reached out for outside help with what was going on in my family, but I was too young. I didn't know. And so I just allowed things to stay status quo the way they were and they knew they could come to me. So I was definitely the caregiver. Wow. Yeah. Not yeah. carefree, not carefree in any aspect. He kind of took the path of, I'm going to be just as carefree. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, like they're, what they're about together. now though? What about now? Let's talk about your carefreeness now. I'm learning. I'm learning. Like studying this was, I mean, it's, it's been, um, eye opening because I, I take vacations with, with family and so forth, but I do spend a lot of time doing things that would probably be a lot of people. I mean, I'm very passionate about, I enjoy it, but at the same time would probably be considered work driven. And so like, am, do I sometimes struggle and fall into, do I feel like being carefree is frivolous? Yeah. I'd say I have struggled with that in my life and definitely something that is a work in progress. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me yeah. too. But uh, yeah, I really, once something is brought to my attention and I think you're the same way, then I'm really curious about it. And I'm like, okay, I want to think about that more and learn about that more. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like spontaneity, like, do I ever just say like, you know what, I'm just going to do this just spontaneously spontaneously oh not much yeah I was trying to think I was trying to think of an example too and I'm like I can't I can't really come up with one but I'm gonna I'm, I'm sure there is one it just caught me off guard so everyone yeah, we're gonna work on think that. About yeah. that you can put comments in the show notes like what does it mean to be spontaneous okay carefree, carefree. sorry carefree right 
and spontaneous. Right. What does that mean? Give us examples. Yeah, give us examples. We apparently we don't. don't. We apparently <laughs> don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then the fifth one: realistic limits and self control. So again, kind of that's one just like the first one that obviously just reading it, you know that when you're in a, that you know codependent relationship, that realistic limits and self control. Like, are you holding the other person to that? Are you holding that to yourself like when you when I think about some of the really ridiculous levels that me my family went to in the name of like codependency um enabling no we did not have like realistic limits when it came to that and so um what I wrote underneath it do you have these for yourself and do you require it of others and so like, and again, these are considered kind of needs. These are considered things like emotional needs that, that um, are important. And so like you can, like one of the, the great things about this and me studying this is seeing that codependency really does take away from the life of the person that you are like being codependent with, right? Because you're you're keeping them from many of their emotional needs and you're certainly keeping yourself from being able to meet these emotional needs for yourself. And we'll put all of these in the show notes. And uh, if you can, Michelle, do you think there's a link if people are interested in like that type of therapy that can you put, we'll put a link in there for them? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So and then yeah, you started, we've gone through your story and then some of the things that you learned, some of the needs. Um, what about like going forward? What do you have? So the last section on um, this outline is I labeled hope because there is hope. Uh, and um, so I, I listed some things hope-wise for um, someone struggling with active addiction and then from the codependency side. And I want to say before I even ever even put these out there that on the addiction side, that person has to be willing. You cannot do it for them. I knew every recovery program free and otherwise in the state of Tennessee before my brother died and he never chose to go that route. So like you can have them, you can have those, but like you can't do it for them. Like there's absolutely, there's way more programs now and there's programs for individuals with insurance, programs for individuals without insurance, um, there's different grants and there's just lots of resources when that person um, is ready to get help. And if I can interject this too, I think, you know, your brother struggled in a time period. It was like an unfortunate time period. I think, first of all, with him being so young and then the time that he was going through that, someone now, you know, there's just there is a lot of hope, you know, there, I mean, there is, there, there is a lot of hope and, um, it can, at the time I, I was this, when somebody first starts looking, it can seem overwhelming because there are sometimes wait lists and so forth, but there are places then I will, um, provide those in the, the show notes as well that can right. help you find the resources you need that then they actually like you can um call that a particular number and they can be of assistance for that so it's not and something I, you have to all do on your own and i want to encourage everybody when i talk about mental health first aid it's not just about um being a bridge for someone who's struggling with just mental health challenges it's also substance use challenges and i want to encourage you even without taking the course to just say, you know, you are not responsible and you cannot and should not, like Michelle has said, be in a position to diagnose them, to fix them. Um, however, being a bridge is amazing. And so Michelle will put some resources in there. And 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 I'm gonna say, correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, if you if they if they're in the mindset of allowing you to help bridge them to resources, then it's okay to take some time to see if you can figure out what might help them. You know, if they're yes, absolutely. for your help. Absolutely. Yeah, that is because I mean, the reality is they, whether it's you or someone else, like that, that particular piece, once they've decided they want to get help there, there may be some things that are needed to step in wise. So it's, that's different than 
like giving them money to continue, you know, like it's, it's a different type of. You are investing your time, but you're investing your time for something productive versus just trying to live out of fear. Well, and and you're investing time to help them achieve these, these needs we were talking about, like to help them get to that, that point. So, and then like, again, there's, there's lots of, of, of resources in terms of like meeting wise, lots of 12 step groups, like, um, NA, which stands for Narcotics Anonymous, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, There is um, Celebrate Recovery, which is, um, I've talked about several times, and it is a ministry that um, was started by Saddleback Church in California. And it is for anyone with hurts, habits, and hangups is what they, they call it. And so like, there are like, particularly the one that I'm involved with at the moment has three different groups. They have a a men's group. Um, They have a a women chemical dependency group, and then they have a women's A to Z, which would be things like codependency and um, depression, anxiety, things like that. So um, it's not just for those struggling with uh, addiction. And Mm -hmm. so you also have programs for families like Al-Anon, and um, there's adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. I've had a couple of people tell me that, that they really got a lot from those meetings. There's codependence anonymous meetings. So there's lots of different free resources when it comes to meetings out there available. All those are free. There's no charge for any of those meetings. And you can do them. I don't know about all of them, but I did the Al-Anon for a while. You can do it live or virtual, at least yes. for some of these groups. Okay. So well, I, I think live is always better, but you know, that's at least like if you wanted to join a group at one in the morning, there's another country that's on a different time zone and you can join that meeting. So, uh, yeah, and that's, that's super important to have that. And, uh, you know, um, accountability is provided through that as well. Like, like I had mentioned it being so much more apparent when you hear your own story told through someone else to be able to pick out that, the um, actions of of codependency and so forth. So having someone that you trust, that you know you're accountable for, that's going to call you on that. And it's going to ask you, what's your motivation behind that? I mean, and sometimes that's all it takes. They just say, what's your motivation behind that? And then if you talk through what your motivation is, that can kind of tell you whether that's probably a a good idea. I'm writing that down. Why have I not heard you use this before? Maybe I have. Okay. Anyway, I got it. I may not have talked about it because I've mentioned CR before, no. not necessarily. No, I'm like, why have you not asked me that question before? <laughs> no, I have. I actually yeah, have. You probably have. You probably, but it's so weird hearing it like out of context. Like probably when you do it, it's just so natural in conversation that I don't even pick that out, you know, is a, a question that you know is important to ask. So I probably don't use the word motivation. I probably use different. That well, different. yeah, but that's a good one. And then, I mean, therapy. Obviously, anybody that knows us knows we're huge like, proponents of of therapy. So, super important to have that outside perspective. I have people tell me, well, you know, I have a really good friend I talk to, which is awesome and amazing. But at the same time, like therapy can also provide insight into some of the things that are are going on. I think that it was really when I first started therapy, I've mentioned this before, but like having that light bulb moment, I was actually in a, standing in a physical science class teaching and I said the, the phrase, if your frame of reference is wrong, if, you ch- if your frame of reference is wrong, all of your measurements will be wrong. And realizing, oh my gosh, a lot of the things that were considered normal in my life really God. are destructive. Yeah. And so some of my decision making, it's it's been flawed. Obviously it's been flawed and, and I need to rewire that. And so that was a really a huge light bulb moment for me. So um so. yeah, I'm right. You've said that before, but it's been a long time and that was really powerful. Um, And I wanted to interject too about therapy, again, just like the support groups, live is always wonderful, but there's virtual in this last bout that I went through. um, So I went back into therapy for almost a year, I think. 
and it was all virtual. Um, and it was just, and it was dealing with a similar thing that you're talking about and just such insight, you know, she, like talking with you is so wonderful, but then also getting just that professional perspective where there's no, you know, there's no friendship attached to it. There's no, it's okay. Let's talk this through and look at this logically. And it was very helpful. Yes. So, okay. And anything else? I, I would, you know, say uh, at, we didn't mention because it's really part of like the recovery um, process, kind of like medication assisted treatment, like like Vivitrol is now um, an injection that's used with um, like alcohol dependence and with opiate addiction. Um, and so there's there's different things like that. And that's a personal a personal choice. So um, that's definitely a resource as well for individuals who are like in that that process of finding their sobriety. You know, that's so good. And I'm going to throw in another mental health first aid phrase. But as if you have someone in your life who's struggling, um, one of the phrases that we teach that I think is really good is for some, for others, for you. And so when we think about like empowering that person saying for some people, you know, going to a counselor is helpful for others. It's a longer type of treatment for you. We need to figure out, you know, what's going to work for you or you need to figure out what's going to for you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you in that. And I, I really like that phrase. Yeah, I would, it's awesome because it's, it's individual. Yeah. You have to support people with their individual um, decisions. So, and that's all I have. Michelle, like if you, if you've been with us before, when we did the podcast together regularly, if we did a longer episode or whatever, we would chop it in half. And this has been a longer episode, but I am not going to chop it in half because I think, I think it was so good. I mean, I think it was so good. You had so much to offer people about someone who might be struggling, a family member who might be struggling. You, you shared the backstory. So we don't forget that people in our world who are going through something, unless we met them while they were going through it. But other than that, you know, especially growing up with siblings or that it, sometimes it wasn't always that way. And it gives you some joy. I saw it on your face, you know, to relive that story. So thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you so much for asking me. You know, what else I'm going to do is put a link because this is related. Um, Michelle did a session with me a couple of years ago about grief, the green sweater. And I think that this ties in well with that, because if you've lost somebody, then, you know, she, she had a lot to say that day about grief. That was really powerful too. Well, this is the end of the season and what better way to end it with, you know, I knew this was going to be heavy, but it was also heavy, but sprinkled with light and you ended on hope. So fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks for being here with me through this whole season. I don't even know what a season is anymore, but I'm ending it now. So you can have your summer to not worry about tuning in every week, but I would love for you to just provide some encouraging words on the show notes, on the Facebook page, um, the the links to both Facebook, my professional, um, I'll have Michelle's bio in there. Um, she's in the private women's Facebook page too. So if you write in there, she'll see it. So yeah, let us know. Like we talked about, what does it mean to be carefree? Share any other tips that you have if you've been in in a world where you have someone in your life who is struggling. We would love to hear it all. And it's been I'm ready. Fun. You ready? Until we're together, maybe in the fall, consider, consider yourself. Yeah, we haven't gotten better at that. No, no better, but that's okay. (laughs)